If you look up at a clear sky right after dusk or just before dawn, with binoculars and a little luck, you might see one. Now, nah, I'm not talking about planets or galaxies or shooting stars. I'm talking about artificial satellites. These man-made objects don't always come with a bright blinking light, but you might catch some sunlight bouncing off of one as it makes its way across the sky. Whether they're connecting us or observing us, Satellites have become an integral part of our everyday modern life. But with private entrepreneurs and world governments sending more powerful satellites into orbit, how will these eyes in the sky guide us into the future? And who stands to cash a big check on the way there? Let's dive in. Welcome to Space Greed. Not all satellites are created equal. Some are naturally occurring, like the moon, comets, or other solar system objects that orbit a larger body. Others are artificial. Let's talk about the fake ones. An artificial satellite is any object launched to orbit Earth or another celestial body that relays radio signals or captures images. Even before we were capable of doing it, humanity dreamed up the idea of sending objects into space. As early as 1687, Sir Isaac Newton published a mathematical study where he used a cannonball's trajectory to explain the possibility of an artificial satellite. He was flexing his brain power and using an artificial satellite, the cannonball, to explain the motion of natural satellites, like the moon. Mother Nature is definitely the world's first influencer, so it's not surprising that we look up at the way celestial bodies fly over us and wonder if we could recreate it. Long before they became a scientific fact, artificial satellites were a staple of early science fiction. Jules Verne's The Begum's Fortune would have probably made for some great water cooler talk back in 1879. But it was only after World War II that sending satellites into space became possible. Initially, like most early space exploration, the focus was on military applications. The first successful satellite, Sputnik 1, was launched by the Soviet Union in 1957. A year later, after feeling the pressure to pursue space dominance, the United States launched its first satellite. Explorer 1. Early satellites like Sputnik or Explorer weren't very complicated. Sputnik 1 was the size of a football and weighed under 200 pounds. It was essentially a metal sphere that emitted radio waves for three weeks until its batteries died. Explorer 1 was lighter, but it also carried a Geiger counter to obtain radiation counts. Explorer 1 helped scientists detect the Van Allen radiation belt, a belt of charged particles that rings the Earth. Within three years of Sputnik 1's historic launch, over a hundred satellites found their way into orbit. And every year since, humanity sends more and more satellites into space. That number has literally skyrocketed in the past few years. There were over 1,400 sent up in 2021 alone. That number will likely continue to rise as rocket and satellite technology improves and space entrepreneurs make big bets on large satellite networks or constellations being the key to the advanced technology of tomorrow. Before we get into the future of satellites, let's look at what came first, Elliot. Early satellites were entirely custom-built. Each one was unique and built for its specific purpose. But later, engineers started to use what's known as a satellite bus. A satellite bus is a standard body to which various separate instruments can be attached. These instruments are often called payloads. Each satellite has specific subsystems to handle different aspects of its mission. A power supply could be batteries, but usually comes from solar panels, a propulsion system to control the satellite's location, specialized equipment to control the satellite's altitude and orientation, a payload to collect information like a digital camera or a radiation counter, and an antenna to transmit and receive information. Right now, there are really only two types of artificial satellites. The first are satellites designed for observation. These are usually equipped with powerful cameras and because they are up in orbit, they provide a perfect vantage point for observing what goes on down here on Earth. As a result, they have a wide range of applications. Weather satellites. 
Weather satellites observe the Earth in the visible and infrared part of the spectrum. In the visible part of the spectrum, one can see clouds, snow, ice, fires, smoke, pollution, etc. The infrared images can be used to measure cloud heights or surface temperatures of oceans and land. Spy satellites. The simple spy satellites observe specific parts of the Earth to look for military installations or troop movements. More sophisticated ones are used to detect nuclear explosions, provide early warnings of missile launches and intercept the communications of other nations. Space telescopes. Instead of observing the Earth, the cameras on those satellites are turned around to observe outer space instead. Space-based telescopes can observe the stars and galaxies without interference from the Earth's atmosphere and light pollution. The most well-known space telescope is probably the Hubble Space Telescope. Hubble is a large space-based observatory that has captured images from some of the most distant stars and galaxies ever seen. It's been in operation for more than 30 years. Hubble can detect light from the ultraviolet through the visible and into the near-infrared. James Webb was launched in December 2021, and since it's capable of detecting infrared light, it will offer humanity a never-before-seen look at more remote areas of the universe. While the Hubble telescope's original mission cost approximately 1.5 to 2.1 billion US dollars, if you were to count up all the repairs, fixes and upgrades since it was put in orbit, the total expense is around 10 billion dollars. James Webb, with its advanced complicated technology, was even more expensive to launch. Its starting price was a cool 10.5 billion. The second type of satellite are communication satellites. These are designed to receive and or transmit information. Most communication satellites are in geostationary orbit 22,300 miles above the equator. They collect, amplify and transmit radio waves, enabling communications between two widely separated locations on Earth. Navigation satellites are communication satellites that transmit standardized time signals. By collecting signals from the multiple satellites that make up the navigation system, an Earth-based device can determine its exact location using the time taken for each signal to be received. In addition to these two major categories, there are things like the International Space Station, which are designed for humans to live in Earth orbit for extended periods of time. Building, launching and maintaining even the smallest satellite is expensive. And even on the best of days, there's no shortage of things that could go wrong. Even the most advanced rockets could fail and your expensive satellite might not even make it off the launch pad before running into a fatal problem. A single launch can cost anywhere from 50 million to 400 million dollars. It takes a lot to stomach seeing that much money turn into a big bright fireball. But if you can tackle the challenge of escaping its gravity and leaving Earth's atmosphere, your reward is getting to tackle even more potentially mission-ending obstacles. You've got your run-of-the-mill operational issues. Things might not operate as designed, or equipment could malfunction. Keeping a satellite in operation requires a highly trained support staff. And if you're lucky, that staff will be able to resolve potential issues from the ground. If problems can't be resolved via a series of complicated software commands, then you gotta send an astronaut up there. And just like you'd expect from an unplanned trip to space, the world's most expensive mechanic bill. Most satellites that break in space aren't repaired. The companies that own them usually just cash in on the expensive insurance policies and try to minimize the financial fallout. The satellites themselves don't get off that easily. Humanity has sent thousands of satellites into space since the 50s, according to the United Nations aptly named Index of Objects Launched into Outer Space, out of an estimated 11,139 satellites launched into space, there were about 7,389 of them still up there at the end of April 2021. The rest have either been burnt up in the atmosphere, returned to the Earth in the form of debris, or now make up the millions of pieces of debris floating around just waiting to mess up an operational satellite's day. These errant pieces of old technology are obstacles that new satellites have to avoid crashing into. And those are just the broken satellites. Depending on who you ask, Earth's orbit is getting pretty crowded with working satellites too. Private companies like SpaceX and Kuiper, a subsidiary of Amazon, have plans to send up tens of thousands more. Musk's SpaceX is developing Starlink, which is being touted as an always-on global broadband internet network. 
Starlink will require so many satellites that amateur astronomers and other fans of a clear night sky are concerned that they'll never get a clear shot again. For the companies and organizations who also have plans to send satellites up there, there's growing concern that large networks of satellites, like Starlink, will impede the paths and block other satellites. Musk thinks there's room for tens of billions of satellites, but there's currently no easy way to know where all the satellites and space junk are located, though there are plans in the near future to address this. The US Space Force is currently developing a powerful system to track all the stuff flying around in space. But until then, we've already started to hear rumblings of near collisions. China recently filed a formal complaint with the United Nations, alleging that astronauts on China's space station were forced to take evasive maneuvers due to avoid bumping into some SpaceX satellites. The only thing scarier than traveling to space yourself might be seeing the bill for launching and keeping a satellite up there. But for the mega wealthy, the space entrepreneurs, and world powers capable of bankrolling a satellite launch and maintenance, there's a wealth of benefits for having powerful computers and cameras in the sky. One key area where that vantage point comes in handy is agriculture. NASA's Earth Observing Satellites and Partnership Programs have helped many farmers monitor and allocate increasingly scarce water resources. The Biden administration has stated that it will prioritize using space-based Earth observation capabilities to tackle climate change. Through collaboration between the public, private, and philanthropic sectors, the U.S. government has set its sights on accelerating the development and use of Earth observation tech to support the fight against climate change. The U.S. is now planning a series of Earth-focused missions to better understand various aspects of climate change. Things like the impact of aerosols on global energy, cloud formation, drought assessment, and major changes to sea level, groundwater, and the Earth's interior. As ever, the real challenge in tackling climate change is to put this better understanding to use, the political will to actually change behaviors. In other words, satellites from up above can tell us what we're doing wrong, but it will be up to us here on Earth to set it right. But one of the main motivating reasons for creating the earliest multispectral satellite systems was the ability to map mineral deposits from space. The Landsat satellites were launched in 1972 to make this a reality. More modern systems like the Landsat 8, Sentinel-2, and Aster can give ever more accurate readings at even higher resolutions. To aid mining operations in their search for suitable sites and to simply keep a long-term record of the world's resources, the U.S. Geological Survey initiated the Global Mineral Resource Assessment Project. The goal of the project is to outline where the world's known metal ore deposits occur and where new deposits are likely to be found. Researchers are developing ways to locate potentially mineralized areas from space. Using the new Advanced Spaceborne Thermal Emissions and Reflection Radiometer instrument aboard the Terra satellite, they are attempting to find areas likely to contain copper in Iran and western Pakistan. If their tests are successful, then Aster and future satellites could aid geologists in pinpointing any number of metal ores, iron, aluminum, copper, or gold. Mapping the world's minerals could not be accomplished on ground or by airplane alone. Those costs would be enormous. The only feasible way to carry out such a large survey is through the use of remote sensing satellites. The odds are, if you ate veggies in the United States, the stuff on your plate benefited from NASA's work with farmers to get them sufficient water for their large farms. Scientists sharing Earth's observational data will likely aid domestic and international efforts to address the climate crisis. But the potential for advanced eyes in the sky that makes it possible to track down even more mineral ore deposits seems to point to a future with even more aggressive mining operations. The increasing rate of consumption seems to only be outpaced by our commitment to finding new ways to exploit natural resources. I wonder if you can see that from space too. For more videos like this, subscribe to this channel right now and hit that notification bell so you don't miss any great content. And look out for Curiosity Stream on social media. Links in the description.